So I'm Jose Falero. I'm a final year PhD student at Yale. Uh, and I'm going to talk about addressing the parallelism gap in replicated server systems. Um, so this talk is divided into four parts. In the first part, I'll go into some background on multi-cores and replication. In the second part, I'll describe log shipping based replication. Um, I'll then talk about a solution to the parallelism uh, gap, which is mentioned in the title. And finally, I'll give a little detail on uh, the implementation challenges in implementing this solution. Uh, OK, so let's just drive straight into background on multi-core and replication. So driven by hardware and applications, uh, server code today has two important requirements. Um, the first is that it must exploit multi-core parallelism. And the second is that it must support high availability via replication. So in any given deployment of server code, we want to marry solutions to both these uh, sort of requirements together. They need to coexist. Um, so multi-core hardware today is now increasingly accessible. It's uh, easily accessible in the cloud, uh, where Amazon provides EC2 instances with uh, 128 virtual CPUs. It's easily accessible on-premise, where systems with more than 50 cores have been widely available for several years now. Um, so given that, this, uh, given that this parallel hardware is widely available, um, we, want to ha we want to make use of it in our server code. And this has led to sort of, we have a lot of advances in programming multi-core machines today. Programming models such as uh, futures and transactional memory are slowly making their way into mainstream languages. And we have better synchronization mechanisms like uh, scalable locks and lock-free algorithms. So in order to take advantage of multi-cores, um, server code just, you know, it has to use the right programming abstractions. We, the, the facilities are there today. At the same time, uh, server code also needs to be highly available. Um, as many of you probably are aware, this is because availability is money. And any losses in availability can have a catastrophic impact on revenue and trust. And sort of the standard way to achieve high availability is via replication. Instead of having a single server sitting there and like, uh, dealing with requests from clients, you instead sort of use redundancy. So this redundancy makes applications highly available, because when a primary server goes down, you have a backup that can take over and start processing requests from uh, clients. Right? And this minimizes application downtime and increases availability. So requests which update a server state are typically executed against a primary. Right? And the primary logs these, uh, puts these updates into a log. And this log is shipped out to a backup. Right? And the backup, uh, the whole point of replication is that a backup should be an exact copy of the primary via by sort of playing back this log that shipped to it. I mean, this is really important, right? It needs to be an exact copy, because if it's not an exact copy, then uh, it doesn't have any hope of being able to service requests from clients if the primary goes down for whatever reason. So at this point, it seems like it's pretty easy to marry these two requirements, right? Because one doesn't seem to influence the other in any way. They seem like two completely orthogonal problems. So we can get multi-core parallelism by leveraging parallel programming abstractions and good synchronization mechanisms. And we can do replication by syncing servers by sort of uh, shipping these logs around. Unfortunately, it turns out that marrying the two is complicated due to non-determinism. Um, Parallel programs are non-deterministic. If you're building a multi-threaded server, then threads can acquire locks in arbitrary orders. If you're using a futures library, then the order in which your promises return results may vary across application runs. Uh, probably the most famous example of non-determinism in parallel code uh, are Heisenbergs. Uh, so just to uh, uh, um, get an understanding of how many of you actually understand or know about this non-determinism. Show a quick show of hands for who's heard about Heisenbergs. Awesome. This is perfect. Perfect audience. Okay. <laughs> so Heisenbergs are bugs in parallel programs that are difficult to diagnose because they do not deterministically reproduce given the exact same input, right? And this makes parallel programs really difficult to debug. Yet, we need determinism for replication. Right? In any replicated system, we, I just said that backups need to be exact copies of primaries. Um, so the, the, now this presents a problem, because given the exact same input which of the log, uh, we're not sure if the replica will actually come out with the state that's exactly the same that sort of existed on the primary. 
Um, so this is a really big problem, because the parallel programming techniques would potentially allow replicas to diverge. So at this point, I just wanted to clarify the assumptions I'm going to make in this talk. Um, how many of you have heard of the CAP theorem? OK. How many of you have you've heard about multi-master replication? Great. OK. OK, if you put your hand up, just forget about the CAP theorem and multi-master replication. <laughs> it has nothing to do with this talk. <laughs> so don't, don't, don't worry about it. It's not important for the purposes of this talk. Um, so the replication mechanism that we're going to talk about today is primary backup replication, in which backups keep in sync with primaries uh, via log shipping. Um, and in a primary backup replicated system, the primary is typically responsible for executing uh, requests which update application state. Right? And, up, and requests which read application state can uh, be serviced by, by both primaries and backups. In log shipping based replication protocols, uh, the effects of updates, as I mentioned before, are put into a log. And this log is then shipped to backups, which apply the log to reconstruct state of the primary. So I'll now, now dive into some details of log shipping and why exactly it doesn't gel with parallel programming. Um, so logs basically serve as a record of what happened on the primary, right? So um, uh, you, it, you, we, we basically want to reconstruct the state of the primary by replaying this log. And the order of log records matters, right? Playing, playing log records sequentially is always guaranteed to be correct. Um, and let's look at what that might look like in the context of an example. So we have these four requests, which are sequentially ordered in the log, and the black box there is the actual state of the application. So when we execute the first request, it updates x and y to x1, y1. The second request updates the value of z to z2. The third request updates the value of y and z to y3 and z3. And finally, the fourth request updates the value of w to w4. Right, so we end up with this state when we sequentially execute these log records. So now, like, let's look at an example of what could happen if we executed these requests out of order. So let's say we first execute request 1. It changes the state uh, of x and y to x1 and y1. And now, instead of executing request 2, we execute request 3. Right? So in this case, request 3 changes the state of y and z to y3 and z3. And request 2 now changes the, va the value of z to z2. Now, at this point, it's clear that the two states are different, right? They've diverged. Uh, and this is because we've executed the log records out of order. Now, the reason that this is, rel now, the reason that this is, that this is uh, relevant for parallel log replay is due to the non-determinism, as I mentioned before. So the typ typically, the way that you parallelize these things is to associate a lock with every object in your system. So the lock will prevent multiple writers from sort of executing their updates concurrently. So it'll ensure that only one writer in a time, at a time can execute updates. Um, so in this case, we know that requests 2 and 3 conflict. Right? They both request a lock on uh, object Z. But the lock doesn't actually, doesn't actually guarantee that request 2 gets the lock before request 3. It could turn out that on a particular run, request 3 gets the lock before uh, request 2. And as a consequence, uh, this is bad because, like, as we just saw, if we execute request 3 before request 2, you may end up with divergent state. So as a consequence of these problems with parallel replication, log shipping protocols often just resort to executing logs serially. Right? The first obvious limitation of this is that you can't exploit a multi-core parallelism to replay uh, log records. Right? But that's a, that's, that's a small concern. The biggest concern is that the primary now can execute requests in parallel, but the, but the backups can only execute requests sequentially. So as a consequence, the rate at which a, the primary can produce these log records far outpaces the rate at which a replic, uh, the backup can consume them. Um, and this is really bad. It can lead to some very serious problems. Um, one of the problems is that it can lead to unbounded replication lag. The problem is that like, since, we're, since the primary is going so far ahead of the replica at a much higher rate, it's, you don't have any hope of the replica ever catching up with the primary. In fact, the gap between the primary and the replica gets worse over time. Second, replicas can't really be used to serve queries because they're too stale. Right? The problem is now that like, if, if, you, if you redirect a client to a replica, it may serve data that is you know, really stale in comparison to what exists on the primary. Finally, this slow replication might even impact availability. 
This is because whenever you need to fail over from a primary to a backup, uh, the backup needs to first synchronize to the most current state of the primary as of the time it died. Um, and this process is really slow. So this has an immediate impact on availability. Right? And, this, the, and as a consequence of this, there are several systems out there that execute uh, logs serially or near serially. These include MySQL and PostgreSQL. And if you go read the documentation in forums, it's also a problem in NoSQL type systems such as MongoDB. And you don't have to take my word for this. Like, uh, here's an excerpt from a blog post by Percona, which is a MySQL consulting and support company. Uh, this is an excerpt that says, the first glaring problem with MySQL is single-threaded replication. Uh, it is severe and getting much worse as servers get more and more CPU cores. The replication process executes in a single thread on the replicas and thus has no hope of ever keeping up with the primary, even on a moderately busy workload. Here's another example of Booking.com. So this is taken from a slide deck that uh, they gave a talk about parallel replication one or two years ago. So they say that parallel replication is new because it is hard. It is hard because of data consistency. You're running transactions in parallel, uh, you need to get the same results on all your backups, and this result must be equivalent to what existed on the primary. So given the background for this problem, I'll now dive into what a solution might look like. So before we do that, let's just sort of map out sort of the objectives of what we want to do. So first, uh, we don't want to make any invasive changes to primaries. Second, we want backups to exploit at least as much parallelism as primaries. And finally, we want backups to be able to serve reads. So we don't want to make any big changes to the primary for several reasons. The first is that any changes to help replication lag might impact performance on the primary itself. Right? So for instance, there's a lot of academic literature on multi-core record and replay techniques, which involve logging low-level scheduling locks and like thread preemptions and whatnot. Um, there also exist other mechanisms that are often used in the real world, such as only acting back to a client when a log record has actually been played back on a backup. And as you can imagine, this can significantly hurt performance. Now, the important point to note about hurting performance on the primary is that the reason you're seeing replication lag in the first place is because you have a non-trivial amount of load on the primary. Now, if you decrease its ability to handle this load, you, and it's not, it's, not a, it's, not a good, it's not a good thing. Um, finally, um, it may turn out that the changes to the primary themselves are, un changes to the primary are unnecessary because we have all the information already in the log. We just need to make better use of it. So I'm now going to talk about the backup parallelism problem. Um, and the basic idea is to use the information in the log to find out what actually happened on the master. Right? And as we'll find out, it's all about conflicts. Um, now, when I say conflicts, I mean that uh, whenever two requests attempt to update the same piece of data, I refer to it as a conflict. Right? And I'll show that the order in which requests occur, in which uh, log, re log records are executed, only really matters for conflicts. So going back to our example, the only reason that we got this divergent state here was that requests two and three both wrote this object Z. Right? And if you consider this request 4, which writes object W, um, we could execute request 4 in any order relative to 1, 2, and 3. And we'd still end up with state W4. Right? This would be perfectly fine, because it doesn't conflict with anything. So the basic intuition for how to execute requests is for conflicting requests, uh, execute them in log order. And for non-conflicting requests, the log order is irrelevant. Um, so to determine which... Uh, Execute, uh, which uh, log records execution needs to be constrained, uh, we can perform a conflict analysis on the log records. So conflict analysis is practical because the log records have to declare what they need to write. I mean, you literally have that information in the log record because that's what a log record is. Um, the, uh, and the output of our conflict analysis could be a directed graph of log records where the edges determine constraints on their execution. So let's look at what that might look like as an example. So we first look at uh, log record R1. We, ha we haven't seen anything yet, so there's nothing to do. We look at log record R2. We see it doesn't conflict with R1, so it just is. <laughs> we then look at log record R3. Now here we see that R3 conflicts with both R2 and R1, and hence its execution needs to be constrained with respect to R2 and R1. Like R1 and R2 have to execute before R3. 
Finally, we look at R4, and since it writes W, doesn't conflict with anything, it's not constrained in any way. Now, given this graph of log records, it's quite easy to execute them in a manner that is consistent with the graph. Right? Uh, all we really need is that uh, it's safe to execute a log record once all its parents have been executed. That's it. Now, the final requirement of any solution to the parallel replication problem is that we'd like to be able to serve reads on backups. Right? This means that any read should observe state that actually existed on the primary. Right? Now, we, we can allow these reads to be stale because of the laws of physics. Right? It's impossible for the reads to be indistinguishable from those in the primary because you physically have to ship log records from the primary to the backup. Now, at this point, some of you may be wondering if the primary and backups are always guaranteed to converge correctly with our conflict analysis, why would serving reads be difficult? Um, and it's best to motivate this with an example. So say we have a social media application uh, where requests manipulate albums and pictures. So every picture, we want that every picture is always associated with an album that actually exists. And this example talks about two requests, R1, which creates an album, and R2, which creates a picture. Now, in, the, in R2's code, we also see that there's a check that the, uh, that the album that the picture references, it checks that the album in which the picture is going to be put into actually exists. Right? And if this check, does, it, and if, if this check fails, uh, it doesn't insert the picture. Right? So as a consequence, there's this implicit dependency on pictures and albums. Furthermore, because this implicit dependency exists, um, we can conclude that it's impossible for R1 to ever occur after R2, and for R2 to have inserted a picture. The reason is that if R2 inserts a picture, then it's necessarily observed that album on the primary state. Right? So it's impossible for R1 to happen after R2, if R2 is going to insert a picture. Um, now, there are a couple of really interesting things about this example. The first is that the two log records don't conflict. Right? They write separate pieces of data. So our conflict analysis would conclude that um, they can be executed in parallel. So it's possible, on, while replaying these log records, that we execute R2, but not R1. But the problem with doing that is, if we now expose this state to a client, then a client could potentially see a state where there's a picture without a corresponding album. Right? And this breaks uh, the application's invariant that every picture is associated with an album. Right? So executing. One of the interesting things to note here, though, is that executing requests from the log in order will still guarantee, will guarantee that these implicit dependencies are always captured. Right? Um, so one possible solution to this problem would be to also just put implicit dependencies into the conflict graph. Right? If you could somehow detect these implicit, these implicit dependencies, you just put them in the graph and we're done. But the problem is untenable because it's really hard to detect the implicit dependencies because they're very application specific. So in this case, uh, this implicit dependency arose because of code in R2. Right? But you could imagine another mechanism to do this. So for example, a client could synchronously check that the album it's going to insert into actually exists. And then only on that check uh, sort of succeeding sort of does it perform the insertion. Now in this case, it's not even in the code. So there's no way to tell when these implicit dependencies actually occur. It's very, it's very application specific. Right? So, 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 this is, so this is a, this is a serious problem, right? But as, as I said before, it turns out again that the order in the log is key. And implicit dependencies will always be satisfied when, if we execute requests in log order. So the solution here is to expose state to reads when we have explicitly computed a complete prefix of the log. Now, it's important to note that this doesn't necessarily mean that we execute everything serially, right? You could still execute things in parallel, but we just have to wait uh, but we just have to wait for a complete prefix to be executed. Right? And, I'll and I'll cover in more detail in the next section how we can actually achieve this in practice. Um, which brings us to implementation. So at this point, I'd like to discuss sort of how we did on the ideal outcomes. So the solution sketch that I provided doesn't really do, has no invasive changes uh, on the primaries. Backups can exploit parallelism by doing this conflict analysis of log entries. And backups can also serve reads by exposing state to reads at complete prefixes. Now, there are two important implementation questions, I think, uh, which are important to think about. 
The first is that conf the conflict analysis process I mentioned is sequential. And as a consequence, there might, it might turn out to be a bottleneck on a, multi, on a large multi-core machine. The second question is how to actually ensure that we're able to get complete prefixes materialized while still executing log records in parallel. And it turns out that the second problem is really challenging. So to recap, right, we use the conflict analysis to figure out the order in which we need to execute log records. This is fairly straightforward to do with a single thread. Right? Uh, the thread walks through the log records in order and for each log record, simply figures out the immediately preceding set of conflicting records. That's it. Now, unfortunately, since this is a single thread, it can turn into a bottleneck on a machine with lots of CPU cores. So what we require to do somehow is to somehow do this conflict analysis in parallel. And there's actually a very straightforward way to do this. Uh, we basically partition objects across various threads in your system. And these threads will only analyze the portion of a log record that belongs to its partition. Um, so every thread just maintains a map from each object to its last writer. And we use this map to create dependencies between log records. So let's look at what that might look like in the context of our example. Um, in this case, we have a request 1, which writes to both partitions. It writes to x and it writes to y. So in this case, both partitions will insert uh, this, a reference to this uh, log record in its map. Next, we encounter R2, and which only writes to Z. And in this case, the, its corresponding partition will update its map. Now, when we see R3, uh, we notice that it conflicts with both R1 and R2. And, and as a consequence, like we can insert uh, the dependencies at this point. It happens to be the case that both Y and Z reside on the same thread. But you can totally imagine this being done regardless of where the actual uh, objects reside. Once it does that, you update the map. And we're done. It's a fairly straightforward process to parallelize this analysis mechanism on a multi-core machine. So now let's switch into how to execute reads on backups. So I previously established that the only way to correctly expose state to clients is when a complete prefix of the log has actually finished executing. However, it's unlikely that this will ever magically happen just by itself. Right? The problem is that the conflict analysis lets log records execute out of order. Right? And as a consequence, there's no guarantee that you'll ever get to a complete prefix of the log being executed when you, know, you get a constant stream of new log records coming in from the primary. So let's, let's take a look at an example of what I mean. So this shows the order in which log records could potentially be executed. Now, we could end up executing R1, uh, R2, and R4 without executing R3. Right? R3 could be executed after R4, but this is perfectly fine in and of itself. Right, the problem is that as you get new log records streamed into the backup, it's not clear that sort of, uh, you know, this hole will not just be moved to somewhere else, uh, somewhere else in the log. So it's not clear that you'll ever actually get to a point in time that we have a complete prefix. Now, so I, I posit that, it's that we have no hope in waiting for complete prefixes because it's just really hard to guarantee. The problem, the, the, the problem is that in order to get a complete prefix, you're probably going to have to quiesce all your updates in your system until you generate that prefix. And that obviously is going to hurt parallelism because you're constraining the number of requests that can uh, execute concurrently. So instead, we weaken uh, the requirement a little bit and instead maintain a low watermark of, the, of a complete prefix. So in this case, we see that requests R1 and R2 have finished executing, and this corresponds to the low watermark of a complete prefix. Right? So in this case, the low watermark corresponds to R2, which, which, which tells you about this, the longest sort of subsequence of the log that's complete. Right? Um, and in addition, we, use an, we can use an incremental checkpointing mechanism to checkpoint state corresponding to this complete uh, partial prefix of the log. Right? Now, obviously, I'm glossing over a lot of details here. Doing incremental checkpointing is really tricky without quiescing updates. Um, but I'm not going to go into the details in this talk. So we're getting towards the end of the presentation. And I'd just like to point out sort of some of the inspiration of where we got these ideas from. So the conflict-driven pre-scheduling was actually something that was implemented in deterministic database systems in uh, 1997. So this was in a paper called High Volume Transaction Processing Without Concurrency Control, Two-Phase Commit, SQL, or C++. Right? And the idea uh, that these 
the, the idea in this paper is to just eliminate non-deterministic concurrency controls such as two-phase locking, and instead just do this conflict-driven analysis before e executing transactions. And the idea was that this would give you far better performance than doing the sort of non-deterministic concurrency control online. So the idea for conflict, uh, for the scalability of the uh, conflict-driven rescheduling came about when I wrote a paper on uh, multi-version concurrency control for a deterministic database system. This was in a paper called uh, Rethinking Serializable Multi-Version Concurrency Control that was published in 2015. Now, there's another issue to this conflict-driven scheduling. One of the issues is that the scheduling at the granularity of a log record sometimes is not enough. Uh, you can still lag behind a primary, depending on the. Uh, you can still lag behind a primary, depending on what the primary does to guarantee correctness. So this talks. This paper talked about sort of fine-grained scheduling of uh, log records. So this was a paper that was published just this year. It was called High Performance Transactions Via Early Write Visibility. And finally, since I gave absolutely no details on incremental checkpointing, uh, here's a paper that was published in 2016 or called uh, Low Overhead Asynchronous Checkpointing for Main Memory Database Systems. And the idea here was to somehow get a consistent checkpoint of a system without having to quiesce all the updates. Right? So multi-core parallelism and replication seem independent and easy to combine in practice. It's like the scene in The Big Lebowski where Walter and the dude seem to think that it's easy to coerce a teenager into admitting that he stole the dude's car. On being unable to coerce the teen, Walter has a complete meltdown and destroys a random stranger's car. <laughs> right? Multicores uh, multi and replication are similarly easy to get spectacularly wrong, even though the problem seems relatively innocuous. So in conclusion, server code must exploit multicore hardware and remain highly available via replication. And it turns out that these two goals are at odds with each other. This is because of the non-determinism inherent in parallel programs. However, it turns out that everything you need is in the log. We can use conflict information in the log to get parallelism, and we can use the order of the log to ensure that implicit dependencies between log records are satisfied for reads. Uh, this is something that we're actively working on. We're both doing research and trying to build this in an existing system. So watch this space. Um, so I'm Josef Alero. Thank you for listening. But before I relinquish, I want to mention that I'm based out of San Francisco and eager to learn about examples of this issue in practice. So if you're experiencing issues with replication lag, I'm happy to meet up in person and chat more. Thanks. <laughs>